For the next address, we have Dr. Priyanka Mathur, Associate Professor, Jain University. Dr. Priyanka Mathur is currently Head and Associate Professor at the Center for Research in Social Sciences and Education, Jain University, Bangalore. Previously, she was the Assistant Professor and Post-Graduation Coordinator at the Master's Department of Political Sciences, St. Joseph's College Autonomous, Bengaluru. A gold medalist in political science from Jadavpur University, Calcutta. She gained a master's, MPhil and PhD degrees at the Center for Political Studies and the Center for the Study of Law and Governance at Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. She has also received a communal scholarship for MSc in post-migration studies at the Refugee Studies Center, University of Oxford, UK. She is a founding member of the Asia-Pacific Refugee Rights Network, a member of editorial board of Refugee Law Reader, Hungary, and of the International Association for the Study of Forced Migration. An international trainer with UN Women and the Forum of Federations, Canada, she has devised modules for Forum of Federations on gender and decentralization and conducted gender and federalism workshops as well as training of trainers workshop on gender for parliamentarians and civil society actors in Myanmar and Thailand. She has published numerous chapters and articles in journals, opposite editorial articles in the Deccan Herald and conducted gender sensitization workshops for universities. Being a recipient of the Schomburg Fellowship, Dr. Mathur has also taught at Ramapo College, Mewa, New Jersey, USA. She has recently co-authored an edited volume with Dr. A. Ravindra titled Discovering New India, Multiculturalism, Pluralism, Harmony, Jain University Press, 2022. Her areas of research and publications are International Politics, Refugee and Forced Migration Studies, Gender Studies, Public Policy and Governance. She is also guiding PhD scholars in the same. Thank you so much um, for the very kind and unnecessarily long introduction. Uh, I would like to first and foremost convey my heartfelt thanks to uh, Supramanya sir for the very kind uh, invitation to be here. Happy to see some colleagues and friends here and very happy to be back at CMR. How are we all doing? Good? Yes. Okay. I was supposed to take the lecture for a full hour, but as we are running short of time, I will make it as quick as I can, okay? Nonetheless, we will keep the content very much there. Um, I was asked to speak to you all a bit on research design. And before I come to that main topic, I will touch briefly on just what is the idea of research, a little bit on ethics. Most importantly, all of us dealing with the PhD scholars right now realize how much that is a critical issue. A bit on research culture also, the idea of what a research culture is, and then come to the framework of the research design. I hope that's fine with everyone. You're all with me here? Yes. Thank you, thank you so much. Yes, can we move to the next slide? Can you keep it here? I'll, I'll, I'll move it. Thank you. What is research? Do you identify with this first picture? How many of you? Raise your hands. Everyone, right? That's what you're doing? Tearing your hair out in sheer frustration? Yes. You should, otherwise you're perfect. Then your thesis should be out tomorrow, right? If you, haven't, if you are not in this situation. Or do you have this nonplussed look like you really don't know what you're doing, where you are, what are you doing? How many you identify with the second one more? Oscillates between the two. Perfect, right. That is what half the PhD journey also is all about, right? Now, the challenge is, and that's what we all hope as guides that we let you come to this, right? that you can actually have this smile in your face and a glint in your eyes that yes, this is what I'm passionate about. 
So my dear friends, the first point about research is what I say always in my RM classes, begin and end, that you really need to be passionate about it. You should know why you are giving so many years of your life to a PhD degree. And I hope that while we do be from here to here, there will be moments when you do come here, right? So keep that in your head. <coughs> um, you've done this in your coursework classes. I'm sure your teachers have done this with you many a times. But if we just look at the idea of research, if you look at it as a noun, what does that mean? That it's a detailed study of a subject, especially in order to discover new information, reach a new understanding, right? That's how you just define it. Uh, maybe uh, people at the back can't see the writing clearly. Um, reflect for a brief 10 seconds. Is that what you're doing in your respective world? Right? Are you really doing a detailed study of a subject in order to discover new information, reach a new understanding? Okay? Now, if you look at the word research as a verb, what does that mean? To search or to investigate exhaustively. I wish Subramanya sir was here, and uh, I'm not sure if my colleague Anshuman would agree with me. I would perhaps disagree with him and tell him that my PhD scholars better give me a literature review which is at least 30 pages long. <laughs> because if you haven't, then you have not discovered your research gap. Because if you haven't at least gone through 50, uh, you know, I'm just giving figures just like that, to know what was missing in it, to be able to argue for your research questions, then you're not there, my dear friend. So a very, very exhaustive literature review in your first year for you to be able to come to the point where you identify your research gap. He may be absolutely right that every guide can take the personal call as to how many pages you need to incorporate it actually in your thesis. You don't have to give your entire bibliographical review. You need to put in your literature review to be able to justify what's new in your work. So that is that job to search or investigate exhaustively and which is the first part of your research design, right? And that is what you must do. When we were at JNU, if it's a five-year PhD, <coughs> two years we only read, two years we're in the field, and one year we spent writing. Simple classification of what your five-year PhD is, right? So this is a very, very important first part of your research design. Let's look at the implications of a research design. And please ask yourself the question morning, night, when you're a PhD scholar. What is new? How new is the new? And what does that new constitute? You cannot be rehashing old stuff at the PhD level. It may have been done by so many people earlier. But what are you, as a PhD scholar, what is the new that you are bringing in? And what does that new constitute? And now, 2023, for all of us living in the privileged elite life of air-conditioned classrooms in metro cities, doing our PhD researches, let's remember there's a very simple another construct that we cannot ignore. I'm not talking of US dollars, please. That's the sign that the app gave me. The implications also monetarily. You may think that you want to do so much of great field research, right? Where is the funding coming from? How are you financing it? How long does your money last? Your field work ends and begins there, right? Please remember the economic aspect of a research design is usually not given in your textbooks. But that is something that each one of us really have to factor in and figure out as part of your research design, right? That implication must always be there at the back of your mind in your so are we all together? Are you with me till now? Any major questions? Any thoughts? Let's move on. I'll come back to this again and again, right? The passion for research. Let me just throw it open for a few minutes here. Any one of you, I'll take three answers from the audience. If I ask you that as a PhD scholar or as an LLM scholar today, what is your passion for your research? What would you answer back to me? 
And right now I'm doing my research uh, in the postpartum depression for the females uh, using Wonderful. Yeah, in a medical imaging and data science. So then I realized what I have learned so far about medical imaging and data learning and data science uh, is not helping me. So I have to really dig out more. So I think uh, more than the outcome is the journey, how you invest yourself and how passionate and uh, how much hard work you are willing to put into your work. So Excellent. I think I'm enjoying this journey. So this is just a phase, and I'm hopeful that <laughs> I'll be getting Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much Thank for sharing you. that. Well, I can tell you that I right now have a 19-year-old daughter who's doing her undergrad in the US. and uh, But I remember my postpartum depression after delivery very well. And we wish we had some material to help us figure it out, you know. But women today have so much at your fingertips while you're at, through your pregnancy or your delivery. But that's that's a research, that's a that's a fertile area of future research. Very good, very good. Anybody else would like to carry on or shall I? Okay, okay. We'll have more space also later. Let's remember that P in the research must be there for you. If you are not being able to find it inside, please dig more. Right? I would really tell you, dig more, dig more, because that's what's going to fuel your journey entire years, right? Keep in touch with it, keep having conversations with the passion. Yeah. Research is, as I said, exploring new knowledge. We had a very simple rule. It was like you should be the material in your area. You should be up to date with it till the night before your viva, right? So you just can't say, well, I've submitted. Now I don't know what's happening in the field. So every day your field is evolving. There is new information coming out. There is new research happening. You need to continuously be exploring that new knowledge. <coughs> you remember that you are there for you. Each one of you as PhD scholars today are in your own way expanding on that existing knowledge. Please take pride in the fact that what is your intuition about your research question and that PhD thesis of your, yours, which should ideally get into academic publications and a book immediately after that, because that's why we are in academia and we're not journalists or just you know in any other research field. That output is the new in that existing. And from your recommendations, your juniors will come and read and they'll have ideas about how to take the field forward again. You are continuously asking that why question, why does all research have to begin with an interesting research question? Because if you don't have that interesting research question, you will have no clue as to what you want to design, right? How you're going to get that bigger design? What is it that you want to do? And continuously, continuously pushing, if you find yourself going a little this side or that side, bring yourself back to the path as to what is the focus of your research. Remember in today's world, uh, comparative literature is at your fingertips. Like even I used to do what Subramanian sir said, we used to go, we never even had newspapers online. Newspaper cuttings would be in these book, big books on the seventh floor of the JNU library and we used to go and sit, read those cuttings and make our notes. Right? So you need to be continuously be in tune with what is your focus and what is the question that you are answering. Because without that, your research design goes haywire. Okay, that's, that's the premise that I'm building up till now. Remember, this is the circle that the search for knowledge in your research design does. How does this happen? I hope you've all also accepted that you are searching for knowledge and you are going to be creating new knowledge. And how does the circle go? Whatever you are defining as the new knowledge you are gaining, that content must be brought within your context. And I repeat these two words. Please remember your content has to be contextualized. Uh, yesterday I had a student of mine who's just submitted a PhD. She is now an assistant professor at St. Joseph's University. She came to deliver a guest lecture on feminist theories of power. And we're talking to a South Indian audience. Most of my students are from South India in the current MA batch. And we're talking of Iris Marion Young's ideas of power, you know, and feminist and patriarchy. And you have to step in to remind the audience that we're talking of Western white feminist scholars, whereas our examples of how our mother always gives the food for the, to the father and the sons first, 
and you know those simple examples of patriarchy are very South Asian, global South culturally rooted. So while you may have literature and information about the rest of the world at your fingertips, remember to contextualize it. I'm sure you have done your other main RM courses. I'm not going to take you through a brief of all of that. But you know your methodology. You know your quality quantity. You know your sampling. You know which methods you want to employ. How are you going to do that, right? So that is, again, the difference and what makes us as academics stand out is that we are obsessed about our methodology. I will, you will see this word passion again repeatedly, the word focus repeatedly. And remember, what are we doing therefore? In the bigger picture, we are performing a methodological analysis in order to answer specific questions. If you switch on your TV on primetime news also, there's analysis of people screaming at one another. When you open the front page of a newspaper, I don't know how many of you still hold a hard copy in your hands. I'm old fashioned, I still do with my morning cup of coffee. So your articles are also telling you, why is it that we still haven't been able to get to those workers trapped under the tunnel, right? Or why is it that the Afghanistan embassy closed down in New Delhi, right? So there is an analysis everywhere. How is ours different? We, we back it up with sound methodology. So it's a methodological analysis that you're doing in your research design. And of course, the actual task of implementing it. What do we do? We're not sitting here and just talking or reading, right? You can't be stuck in just your literature review because you will be then going out and gathering your data, your information, facts for the advancement of this knowledge, right? This circle is your search for knowledge. And this circle is your research design. Are you all with me? I'll take you more through it, right? This is just the overview of it. We'll come down to the exact brass tacks too. Are you all with me till now? Yes. Okay. Anybody's any reflections? Fine? Okay. Now, <coughs> I will take a short break here because I'm deviate from the allotted topic to me that is research design and come back to just briefly touch on ethics. Because the more and more we see in the world today, and with the coming of AI and chat GPT, it is even more critical today for us, right? So let me remind all of us again, I'm sure you all have done ethics, but please remember when you're doing your research, you all know this. What is fabrication? Can all of us take an oath here, kind of, that we will not be making up data or results? As academic researchers, we just do not do it, right? Because you are accused of doing the unethical thing of fabrication when you make up your data or your results. What is falsification? No, question, uh, is extrapolation is also not allowed. But Absolutely right. Extrapolation is not allowed. Extrapolation is what also we term as the fallacy of generalization or overgeneralization. So if I have interviewed only 25 people in this audience and I'm kind of take an analysis of, okay, how was my session? And I'm just trying to get an answer to that question. I will say that 25 of these 100 people said this. You cannot say, oh, 25 said this, so the entire audience said this. That's when you're very grossly extrapolating and you're making false generalizations. You may just say that since one fourth of the audience felt this, it, we would wonder as to how the others could and maybe what are the implications of one fourth of the audience feeling like this. You can draw some suggestions and generalizations just to a little extent that maybe others could be thinking. We weren't able to interview the other 75. But then if 25 thought this, there is a high chance that maybe the other 75, many would have also thought that that way. You're going to word your, your answers. You can't, cannot say 100 said that. Like you cannot put a small picture of the audience and say, oh, the entire hall was full. Right? What we see in our media nowadays all the time, right? With the fake news and the deep embedded fakes. That entire word. Remember changing or misreporting data or results is, what is the word? Falsification. Your journey is towards the truth. 
and of course the word plagiarism using the ideas or words of another person without giving appropriate credit which we now please i i'm sure your teachers have done that we all have the plagiarism softwares uh, your teachers are not dumb we all have turned it in we all have it it goes in word to word we can figure out how much is plagiarized and in which way okay our battle is with the ai but i'm sure we will we'll get there too right now so the fraud triangle what is your opportunity how much are you rationalizing how much pressure are you on in how do we start making up stuff how do we succumb to the fraud triangle when do we do that when our opportunities are less when the pressures are very high and when we are forced to rationalize we succumb to doing unethical things please remember it's really not worth it and that's not why you should be here right and i'm sure to this wonderful audience at cmr none of you will even get there right yeah yeah now again remember research is a collaborative work different conventions they have different uh, you know rules about mentioning of the authors if you're doing some collaborative work please figure this out earlier who's going to be the first author second author order of importance and contribution to the work order of importance and seniority alphabetical order all these things really really matter when you're doing collaborative work <coughs> i now briefly touch on the idea of a research culture because any person's your own individual research design will not really work if you don't have a research culture in your university that's your immediate space right now i don't need to question that i am here as a resource person for a national uh, for a one day workshop on rm so i'm very proud that this university definitely holds it as does mine where i come from right but the fact is it's very important for us you cannot be working in silo and isolation for your research work to be in a space where we have this research culture where we emphasize the building of the research culture how research is critical in higher education that you see all our higher education bodies today emphasize that because that is why you and i are standing here today right there is a teaching learning process in it and there is knowledge transfer when these are prioritized we know that we are in a robust research culture right let's remember when we talk about culture enter is it something that can be cultivated is it something that is widely shared or a strongly held view you think a research culture can be cultivated can it be yes yes why do you think it can't be cultivated sir uh, well i'm saying like this something it can be influenced it can be motivated okay but uh, the inherent nature of the research right it has to come within or develop within it Yes, sure. I'm saying it's predominantly like self-driven, hmm. and of course, like it can be influenced, it can be nurtured by the external factor, including the faculty as well. Hmm. Yeah. But uh, the urge has to come from inside. Yes, but if you have the urge and you don't have any clue what to do after that, yeah. then you'll not be a PhD scholar at all, or a successful PhD scholar, or a doctor many years later. Hmm. So we all are banking on that hope. that all of us as we even grow older 2023 is just the start years down the line when each one of you are in your professions maybe supervising phd scholars are looking at others you know that you have helped in building this research culture we can definitely cultivate it and that is what we must not stop doing because otherwise each one of us will become those silos right so the bigger picture the environment is where it needs to be cultivated Now just like we say the lady doing the research on postpartum depression you are not born a mother like the morning of my delivery i had no clue what to do with the little baby squealing in my arms right you think oh it's just a god gifted thing it's not a hard it's not a program in our brains it's not it's something that's been fed and now we become a mom similarly each of you sign up for a research program phd or an mphil and till no longer there like you think you're going to wake up the next day morning and know how to do it no so research is an acquired behavior it's a behavioral trait that we also develop 
we become better researchers. We become researchers when we weren't researchers. Which is why also in an MA degree, we bring in an element of a dissertation in the fourth and the third sense so that our students figure out are they meant for research or not, right? In your masters. So it is an acquired behavior. And in research culture, it's very important for us to look at how important are the structures, the processes, and the attitudes. Let's look at that a little bit more. When we look at research culture, research culture is about communication. Whose roles? What are the expectations? What is the credibility? What is the authority? Right? There are roles. There is a student and there is a supervisor. There are very clear roles. As a supervisor, I don't own my students' research ever. I remember my, the golden words my supervisors always told me when I'm walking into my viva or anything. Professor Nija Jayal, very well-known professor from Jawaharlal Nehru University who just retired, very famous political theorist. She used to just always stand behind her students and just say, remember, nobody in this room knows about your work as much as you do. Right? Imagine the confidence boost you get when you walk in to talk about your work. Right? So there are roles. Like, we have a golden rule. No, no research guide suggests a topic. We just don't. Because there is, there is a level of authority in our structure, right? You'll always think, oh, Subramanya sir said that, and Shuman sir said it, and Kamam said it, I should do it. That's not going to sustain your passion for five years or four years or three years, my dear friends. Our job is to make it come out from you. To push you to see how you can come and talk about what you want to do. Ideally, that's an ideal situation, right? So there is a team, there are individuals, there are mentors. Culture can only be taught, cannot be taught. It has to be experienced. Beliefs and practices, there are distinctiveness, there are differences, there is diversity. And there are always the individual researchers in the university which make up that research culture. Now, three words for you and I will pass the mic Yeah. Do you think they are all the same? A work plan, a research design, and a research method. Think. 30 seconds. Think. I'll give the mic to three people, please. Do you think it's the same? A work plan, a research method, and a research design. No, please, no negative marks for answering wrong. We will not judge you. Yeah, we will not judge you. Come on. A work plan is more at the surface level according to me. And a research design and a research method, it's more detailed. So which is the biggest? The research method. This is just my um, yeah, understanding. No, no. Sure, sure. Very good. Thank you. Anybody else? Anyone else? Raise your hand. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Work plan is something, any work which has to be done needs to be planned. And the research design is what is in your mind and what you want to bring out of your research design. <coughs> Whereas research method is the point where you, have to, you are going to implement the design into action. Okay, and good. it has to be brought in a very detailed way and in a very uh, research uh, designed methodology. Okay, thank you. One more hand. Anybody else? The lady here uh, on this side. Yeah, lady in pink. Yeah, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, research design is like the start of our research to the end of it. Uh, research method is like basically how do you extract the data? Mm -hmm. Can you um, give me any example? Any word which comes to your mind when you say research method? Ma'am, qualitative methods, quantitative mixed methods. Mm -hmm. so, so that is research method. Research design is a more holistic way, mm -hmm. uh, and work plan is like. Uh, how do we like carry out the work? Okay. So, absolutely right. And sir, the person who answered first, remember your method are one of your tools to get your data. Right? They are your tools for data collection. You decide the method you will use, right? 
Are you going to cook it in the microwave or in the on the gas? You want to cook. What's the method you're going to use? So if I have decided that my third state for data collection is West Bengal, my research design tells me that I'm looking at the rights of people displaced by developmental projects in three states. That's my whole plan. That's my biggest, pick, bigger picture. My method is that I am going to only do qualitative, deep, intensive, focused, individual interviews with people who are displaced, with policy makers, with people impacted by the projects. So my method is, I know I will do one-on-one -on -one interviews. I'm not circulating a survey or a questionnaire or you know any instrument through Gmail, right? And what's my work plan? Oh, I'm trying to figure out which summer will I get two months of leave so that I can go and actually do it. Get the bigger than the tool and how you actually pull it down. So always remember, before you embark on your data collection, you must have your biggest picture in place, which is your research design. And do not confuse or use them interchangeably. Research design is not research method. Okay? <coughs> so what is a research design? It is the framework, the first keyword. Any serious research work requires this research design, the outline, or the structure. Okay? So you, it is most importantly a framework. What does a research design help us do? Why should you have that research design? Because it will keep giving you your focus. You're building a house. An architect has to first draw the plan, right? And then you keep going back, Acha, ground floor mein yaha tiles kam kar dete hai, first floor mein chalo, veranda badha dete hai, third floor mein we can add a fourth floor, we'll do a barsati. You can do different things to it. But you need your first plan because it will keep your focus. Don't ever step on, start on on your research without a plan. You will be lost, my dear friend. You can take it from me right in today. That if you have not developed your research design, then you cannot proceed. So it will help you in ensuring your focus. Research design ensures our continued focus on our research question. How many PhD scholars here? Around 50, 60, 70? Each one of your research design is separate from your next person sitting next to you. It cannot, must not, can never be similar in any manner whatsoever when you're doing a PhD research, right? So remember, what's the beauty of your research design? It's uniqueness. Five people may have done, maybe her, the ladies seniors in her discipline who may have done work in postpartum depression also, right? But her research design will still be unique. Because she's going to tell you how hers is going to be different from the others and what more new work she's going to add to it. A research design is not a work plan. The work plan flows from the research design. And that is why also your research design is unique. And why are you doing it? Why will I build a multi-storied building on a wetland? It will collapse, right? Your rational, you need to, when you face your committees, your dissertation committee, or your, your review committees, you will have to continuously argue for your rationale. And remember, there may be logistical problems, like I can't go for, to the field right now, <coughs> there is some issue there, the epidemic came, this comes, that comes, money issues come, I'm caught up with other things, people take a break. These are all logistical issues. But you know that there is not a logical flaw in it. There is a rationale. There is a logic and a reason why you are doing that research design. It's very important for us, and I repeat this because more often than not, we see scholars confuse the two. Please do not remember to separate your method from your design. And I repeat this, method is different from a design. Method is about your data collection strategies. Now, let me ask you a simple question. Is the logic of the research design dependent on the method of data collection? 
or is it the other way around? I repeat the question. Is the logic of the research design dependent on the method of the data collection or is it the other way around? Just think, reflect, think. Not an easy question to answer, but just think. Anshuman, pass the mic to you. Yeah, don't take my word for it. I have no other student. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Yes, everyone. Yes, yes, ma'am. Please, good. Do you decide your method first, or do you decide your design first? That's also my simple question. Well, yes, let her answer. Yeah. Yeah. So primarily, we definitely go with the research design, but. Uh, my experience, like when I went through my journey, and it got changed later. Actually, my logic actually got altered on the basis of the mind that your logic I'm going to have. So eventually, my topic and everything got changed depending on how am I looking for the data collections. I mean, this is my journey. I'm not sure if it's logically correct or not. Now, please remember, her case happens also. Everything turns on its head. Once you do your pilot, you go to the field, you realize this is not workable, and you and your supervisor sit around and you turn it entirely on its head. And you throw the whole plan out of the window and start to think of threshing out a new plan. Those horror stories also happen. Yeah, so in my case, I think that yes, the logic is logic of research design is dependent on the how you are going with the methods as well. Okay, very rash, very good rationale for arguing that. Anybody else? Anybody else? Please remember. Yeah, so your correct answer is that you will, the logic of the research design is not dependent on the research method. You need to first figure out definitely what you want to do. Because remember today, in today's like, I wouldn't be maybe saying this in an RM class five years ago, but or 10 years ago, but today we know that with technology at our end, with information, communication technology, with greater access, six degrees of separation and everything in the world and the blended world that we all are living in, and with AI too, I don't believe I said this in an RM class, but still, yeah, okay. Uh, you can do as many research methods as you can. And you may keep changing that, and you may keep doing different more. Like, I, I know I have to go to West Bengal, right? I have to go and collect data from there. I may have in my head thought that I'm going to only do intensive interviews. But if I get there and I find the access, and I think that I can also circulate quantitative questionnaires, I would. When you are presenting this before your panel, and when you are arguing for it, you need to have a methodological plan in head. But we don't decide first that, oh, I only want to do qualitative interviews, or I only want to do quantitative data collection, and then make your research design come from that. Now, again, as I said, this is an ideal construct. And today, this is becoming very gray. And it's dependent, again, on your field, the reality of your field how you are doing it in 2023, 2024 may be very different from what someone just did it a year ago. Okay? But keep that in your head that you need your research design first. And then you see what tools are you going to employ. You would have always thought of it, but then you justify the tools inside that research design. Now, if you know very well from before that what are the methods you want to do, if you want to do it the other way, if you want to do it the other way, as I said, today it's not written in stone, then, then you have to think that, okay, my research design has to be such that I'm only going to be doing quantitative, right? If I know I'm only doing quantitative data collection, then my research design needs to be planned in that manner. Now, my warning to you that is if you go that way, your research output will be limited. Plan your bigger picture in your head always first, because you can keep pushing those boundaries, right? And you have the whole array of tools to choose from. 
Okay? Now, next. So, the critical elements of a research design. Your research design has to always be the link to your research question. I'm sure each one of you have done that. You know that you have to have your ROs and your RQs, right? So you has to be linked. Like I cannot have a research design that is in no way connected to my research question, right? No, like that's elementary. So you have to remember that it has to be linked to your research question. Now there can be two types of questions. You can have a descriptive research which asks the question, what is going on? If your research question is in the framework of, oh, I'm asking, what is happening? What is going on? What is your research? It's a descriptive research. If your research question is in the realm of, why is it going on? Then it is a, what's the word there? Explanatory, Explanatory research. OK? What happens in a descriptive research is that you are giving a description of a situation. At PhD, we must rise a little higher above just descriptive analysis. OK? In explanatory research, we focus on the why. We focus on the consequences. What happens because why this is happening, right? And you have to continuously keep linking. Remember, I'm bringing in five. I'm bringing in all of this again back. You bring the link again to all this back to your research design. Because when you keep linking your questions and your model of research back to your bigger research design, you are reducing ambiguity. Like I want to know why is the why are the people <coughs> from Nandigram protesting against the government? I don't need to go into I don't need to go into a detailed analysis of what is the Indo-Bangladesh relationship there, right? So just keep your focus and that will reduce your ambiguity. Remember, your research design defines the nature of your research. Okay, that is the framework that we have here. We are running a little bit out of time, but then still last two slides here. Okay, and then I want to leave a little bit of time if any of you have any questions with your research work at the moment. So what do we define as a research design? Typical textbook stuff. But it's important for us in these occasions to remember the typical textbook language. A research design is the task of defining the research problem, which is the preparation of the research project. That is what you define as the research design. That means what are you doing actually? You're making the decisions regarding what, where, when, how much, by what means concerning an inquiry or a research study. That constitutes your research design. When you're finding an answers to all of this, then you are framing your research design. What are the first procedures therefore? You design your methodology. <coughs> That's the very first step. And as I repeat again, this is academic work. We define our methodology. We design it. You look at your population and your sample. Whom you're going to be with? How many is the reasonable number? Right? You can't think today that you're going to go to Iran or you're going to Pakistan or Afghanistan to do data collection, right? You may wish for it in your head. Like I had an MA student who wanted to do a thesis on uh, uh, legitimizing sex work. And before I knew it, she had taken a train and gone to the brothels from Bangalore. She, uh, over a weekend, she went to Bombay. And she was in Dharavi for two days. It scared the life out of me. I was like, OK, guys, just take a chill pill. Calm down, you know? But she was like, ma'am, I can do it, and I will go and do it, you know? So figure out how much you can do what you can do. and. Be very, very reasonable about it. So what is your population? Like who are, population means the bigger universe. Sample is from there how many people you're going to take. What are your instrumentation? What are your sources of information? 
your primary data, your secondary data, right? How are you going to, be going to get all of that? And remember, at this stage, it's very important for you to do a pilot testing. What does a pilot testing mean? You do a small sample in the field and figure out that does it work or not. The pilot testing helps you test the procedures, the validity, and the reliability. After you have done all of this, will come your data collection procedures. I'm, I mean, it's given, but I'll still repeat it. You have to have what? You have to have primary data. That is why it's a PhD. That's why it's new. That's why you're bringing something new on the table, right? And then finally, is it okay to go and collect your interviews and sit in your office and say, I've done my work? Wonderful. Oh, yeah. Fine, done. PhD over. Collected, done your interviews. You have all your recordings, you have all your transcriptions, done all your collection. Done. Let's wrap it up. <laughs> That's the real part. That is when you start doing your data analysis, and then you're reporting the procedures and the actual writing of the thesis. This is your research design. Your research design, the main characteristics, neutrality. Do you think a lady who's been a mom will do a better research on postpartum depression than a gentleman in the room? I would like an answer to that. And I'm asking a very loaded question. Do you think that a lady who's been a mom will do a better research on postpartum depression than a gentleman in this room? Yes. Yes. And what if I tell you, you're all suffering from a subjectivity bias? <laughs> of course, but you're not supposed to be bringing your own experience and your own subjectivity into your research question. You must always stay neutral. That's very, very critical. She's not supposed to be talking about her research. She's supposed to be speaking to uh, 20 women in this room, 20 men who've been partners for those women, and then tell us what they have said. She is not a respondent in her own research. Please remember, Neutrality is the very critical part of research. I may be from a marginalized community and I may be passionate about doing research about that marginalized community. Now, I may have already preconceived notions that, you know, oh, the Muslims are treated like this, or the tribals are treated like this, and I want to go and do research. Now, if you do actually go into the field and your field happens to be a, com uh, a geographical space where there are very good rights conditions, Will you come back and falsify that data? So you yourself may be from that community. Your job is to report in your thesis what you saw and whether it matches with what you believe or not. That is your only job as a researcher. Neutrality, remember reliability. Reliability means that if five people again go back to the same field and ask the same questions, they should technically come back with 80% of the same answers. That means I can rely on it to be true. Okay? Validity, it stands the test of time. It's truth, it's valid. It cannot be, someone can't come tomorrow and say that's an invalid conclusion that you have drawn. Right? And finally, Generalization. Yes, with that tre tremble in your heart, as a PhD scholar, you will stand and when you defend your thesis, you will say, and so from my work, I conclude that A, B, C, D, E, F. Your answers to your hypothesis to your RQs. You're supposed to be making your generalizations from your data analysis, they cannot be over generalizations, right? That is the very important characteristic. Okay, and uh, finally, last slide. Uh, how much time do we have? We are out of time, right? Majorly. 
Okay, quickly, I will actually leave this with you all. You are free to you know, go through this on your own. It's already there with Ramya ma'am. Uh, in research designs, here are some differences when you have an exploratory research design, when you have a descriptive research design, and you have a causal research design. When an objective, remember, a descriptive exploratory research design speaks about the discovery of ideas and insights. The objective of a descriptive research design is going to be describing the market characteristics or say functions. And a causal one, the objective will be to determine the cause and effect relationship. Okay? So, in a, the characteristics of an exploratory research design will be, it will be flexible, it will be versatile, often the front end of the total research design. In a descriptive one, you will have a prior formulation of a specific hypothesis, it will be pre-planned and structured. And remember, in a causal one, when you have your hypothesis, there will be the manipulation of one or more independent variables, you will be controlling the other mediating variables. Methods used in exploratory, you can do expert surveys, pilot surveys, case studies, there can be qualitative secondary data, and there can be original qualitative research. In descriptive, you can also use secondary data, which is quantitative. You can use surveys, panels, observational, and other data. And of course, in causal, you will have to do experiments also, more with the field of psychology you know, and sciences. And finally, please remember, and I'll repeat this once more, that the essential characteristics of a research design is that it's not written in stone. You have drawn out your blueprint. If your architect cannot deliver that brick or that stone, you will make a change, right? It's in your hands to remember that there has to be flexibility. A research design which cannot be flexible is not a workable research design. What I'm talking in 2023, when I get to the field a year later, I don't know. Okay? So, there must always be that scope for flexibility. It has to be appropriate. Now, that's a very loaded word. Now, I, I'll just simply say, it's like, you know, I, I see so many people have so many ambitious plans. Now, what is appropriate in that cultural milieu, in that religious milieu, in that grassroots milieu? You can't come in like that, you know, uh, the typical, uh, uh, Journalist types with the mic, you know. You have to understand a sense of propriety and ethics with the way in which you design your research design. Like I cannot decide that I want to do it and so I will go and stay in that deep tribal hamlet and will ask them the questions and get the answers out. Please understand the appropriateness also. Efficient. What is efficiency in research, finally? What is efficiency in research? <coughs> Anybody? How many years do you have for your PhD? How many years, how many semesters are you given, maximum? You complete a PhD in CMR in how many years? Three? You're asked for an extension of one, maybe four? See, I knew that. Someone here will say there is a maximum six, right? Now, do you want to stay on for seven years? So, please make a plan that will wrap up in three. You have to think of the efficient ways. I may wish to do, go to the moon and do research. I may wish I'm so passionate about it, I can spend my entire life, years and years, right on it. A PhD program is a time-bound program. You can be a scientist and a researcher who can then in your lab do this all your life later. That's different from a PhD research design. A PhD research design is time-bound, period. There's no argument on it. And there, there is only one qualifying characteristic to a good PhD. And we say this to all our last semester students. A good PhD is only which is a submitted and a bound PhD. So unless you have the courage to wrap it up and then finally say, okay, I let go and I give it for 
submission, it's not a good PhD. So efficiency is time. It is very, very important. Again, the monetary factor, the efficiency of not just time and resources, how economical it is. And finally, we are <coughs> waiting for the day. I don't know if Anshuman and I will live to see days in which we have robots. We know <coughs> the brick and mortar classroom is also now on the tenter hoax. <coughs> the pandemic has shown us as to how classrooms can be online, things we never thought of, and stuff like that, right? Um, so tomorrow, if robots do that, um, you can say that, ma'am, there's no subjectivity bias at all, right? But in the field of social sciences and humanities, law, all of us, what we're doing, we are not hard sciences here, okay, who do their work in laboratories where there are strictly controlled external conditions. So when it is a human being doing research in the field of the human arena, which is a society, there will be bias. You cannot escape bias. Just because uh, Priyanka Man came here today and said that, from tomorrow I'll be completely neutral. Not possible. We are human beings, there will always be a bias. Every fact has a value. But then, you should try to minimize the bias and maximize your reliability. If anyone tells you no bias, Please say first, not possible, right? So we have to be cognizant of the fact that there will always be some biases. But as a researcher, you need to work very hard in making it as neutral in minimizing the bias and maximizing your reliability, right? Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure being with you all. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? Anybody has any points? <coughs> you said uh, we'll be uh, talking about AI. AI. Uh, yeah, so we already, have, we already have term papers being term, given, chat, gen, chat GPT generated term papers being submitted. Know that that's coming in, right? Yeah. And uh, I recently read that some Scopus papers, uh, magazines, journals. Uh, they have guidelines that uh, a human intervention is must, but still with AI is. Uh, so we do that, right? So if your human intervention comes in through your primary data collection, the scope for AI coming in is lesser. And so definitely in humanities and social sciences, in the area of legal uh, sciences and law, that should be you know, very much possible that we minimize the space for artificial intelligence coming in with as much of greater human interface. I, I somehow I'm smiling because I know that can also be perhaps you know today AI can maybe even manipulate human uh, interface. Still, yes, ma'am. Ma'am, how to doing uh, different own methodology? Sorry, different. Different own methodology. Your own methodology. Yes. So there are some your own idea. Okay, uh, tell me, give me one line of the, your research. What is your plan? What do you want to do research on? Uh, my plan is... Uh, I think in, in your area. public huh? smoking someone is an affected other person. So passive smoking, right? Yeah. Yeah, the impact of, say, passive smoking Ooh. in an already polluted city like, say, Bengaluru. Right? Now, will you only speak to smokers or will you also speak to... Pollution. No, but I'm asking, whom will you speak to? Will you speak to your data will only be with people who are smoking or people who are non-smoking also? Not smoking, and smoking include ma'am, but affected other. Yes. How do this uh, control? Okay. But so you, hmm, carry on, yeah. How to doing own methodology? It's a different, different methodology ma'am, like, so. Yeah, so your own methodology will come up when you decide which part of the city or which part of the country you want to do your research on, how many people you want to speak to, what is the primary data you want to gather, because, and your name is? Suma. Suma, because only Suma's research will look at that. Nobody else's research will look at that, right? 
And so that will be your own methodology design for your own research design. Okay, thank you. Is that, are we done? So we are running very late. Thank you so much then. Thank you. It was really lovely being with all of you. Look forward to being here again. Thank you.